Catherine Kirgel, I am the CEO of One Girl, and thank you so much for giving me your time this afternoon. And look, I give a lot of speeches. It's my third today. And the number one thing I get asked at the end when I get to it, doesn't matter how many interesting topics I've covered, is how is it that you're a 25-year-old CEO? So I've decided to get that out of the way, and I cover that straight off the bat. So I want to talk a little bit about how I ended up standing here today speaking to all of you. And to answer the question, I actually have to go way further back than the CV or what I studied. I have to explain to you two things that I'm incredibly passionate about, and that's education and gender equality. So let me take you way back when to me growing up in the early 1990s in middle America. And something that's a little bit unusual about my background or different about my background is that I didn't grow up with a mom and a dad. I grew up with two moms. And that was in a time and a place where being a lesbian and having a child was even less accepted than it would be in a lot of circles today. But you know, as a child, I had no idea that my family was different, that my family was unusual. I had my two moms, then my dad is a gay man, he lived next door, had a partner as well, so I kind of felt like I'd hit the parent jackpot with my four parents all around me. And I was incredibly spoiled, and also my parents were the type of people who really valued education. My non-biological mother was a lawyer, my biological mother was a scientist, and uh, when they decided to have a child, they looked next door, realized that the gay guy next door had a PhD, and said, oh, he'll do. <laughs> so I had these really highly educated parents who wanted the same for me. And that was something that was kind of uh, instilled in me from a really young age. It was just expected that I would go on to study at university, that I would go on to be highly educated. And so I never questioned that. So anyway, the point of this story is that I, I really didn't realize that I had this unusual family until, as it strikes many people with an unusual family, it happened one day on the playground at school. I was about five years old. I heard two students arguing, and I heard one kid say to another kid, that's so gay. And I remember feeling it like a kick to my stomach. I thought, they're using the word gay to replace the word bad. Does that mean they think gay is bad? Does that mean they think gay is weird? I kind of, kind of just couldn't find my voice to speak up. I couldn't find a way to explain to these kids, like, no, 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 my parents are gay and it's fine. And so instead I felt myself shrinking back, feeling sick to my stomach, unsure of what to say. And I said to myself in that moment, I was a pretty annoying kid, I was like, that's it. I'm not going to accept this. Whatever I'm going to do in my life, I'm going to find my voice and I'm going to speak out about the things that matter to me. So at the time, my non-biological mother was working as a lawyer, and she'd come home at the end of the day and tell me her lawyerly stories from the day, or the PG version of her lawyer stories at the end of the day. And she actually told me about fighting a death penalty case. And I remember, as a young person hearing this, thinking, oh my god, that's it. This woman got her law degree. She was able to speak out about something she believed in. She convinced a judge, and she literally saved a dude's life. I'd never heard anything so incredible, and so I thought, that's, that's what I've got to do. I've got to become a lawyer. That's how I'm going to create change. So I raced my way through into studying law at the University of Melbourne and ended up in a really interesting position, which was working in prisons at the age of 21, which is a place I didn't expect to find myself at 21. But, you know, I actually I loved the law. I loved studying. I found it academically interesting, intellectually challenging. I'm obviously not in the law anymore, but I met my partner there, so I'm not allowed to say I regret the degree. And working in prisons, I finally got to interact for the first time in my life with people who had a really different background than myself. Because quite frankly, being at Melbourne University, there's a lot of people who were from the same socioeconomic group as myself and from the same educational background. But working in prisons, and in particular in the prisons I was working in, men's prisons, suddenly it was a completely different group of people. And nothing has made this stand out to me more clearly then in one of my first presentations, when I'm feeling like a regular Harvey Specter, I'm feeling like a big lawyer, and I uh, had, uh, had this guy, Jamie, who had been back about 11 times to my seminars. I'm like, Jamie loves my sessions. I'm so good at this. I was handing out pamphlets, ran out of pamphlets, said, sorry, guys, I'm going to have to go print more. And Jamie said, oh, you know what, miss? Don't worry about it. I actually can't read. And he handed his back. And I, again, felt that sick feeling in my stomach of, oh my god, he's not here because I'm so good at these sessions. He's here because I'm terrible at them. I'm pointing to slides he can't understand. I'm handing him things he can't read. So he's coming back again and again just to get the information. And I realized in that moment that my capacity to read and write and speak the way I'm speaking to you now is the product of the education I've had. And that, it, that wasn't something that was a given. That's an opportunity that I've had in my life. And it really reinforced for me in that moment, in an environment where 60% of people don't have functional literacy and numeracy, how privileged I have been to be in that position. So that's half the battle. That's education. But I actually have to pause here, and I have to explain to you how I ended up with the name Morgan, which, as many of you will have recognized right away, is an androgynous name. 
So when my two moms in male-dominated industries in the early 1990s found out they were going to have a daughter, they said, ah, let's give her a name where an employer wouldn't know if she's male or female before they met, met her. And that sounds kind of ridiculous, and a lot of people are like, oh man, that's, that's really some crazy forward thinking. But it's something that I get to see all the time now as a young female CEO, because I'll go into meetings and people will say, oh, you must be Morgan's assistant. And I'll have to say, no, I am she, which I love because it's easy to negotiate with someone who erroneously assumed you were going to be a dude. Like, it just makes it so much easier. So I thank my mothers for that all the time. And so these are these two things that I've always had in my life, education and gender equality. And they came together for me at a pivotal moment in my life when I was scrolling through Facebook. So I was scrolling through Facebook. I came across the advertisement for the role of CEO of one girl. And I remember swiveling around in my chair and saying to my partner, that's my job. He's like, what are you talking about? You've got a job. I was like, you don't understand. That's my job. And I stayed up all night writing the application. And that's because this is an organization that speaks to me and speaks to those two passions that I've always had. Because unfortunately, it doesn't seem like my clicker's working again. So I'll have to explain that one girl is on a mission to educate one million girls across Africa. We've been going since 2009, and our mission is focusing on countries that are some of the hardest places on earth to be born a girl, specifically in Sierra Leone and Uganda. In those countries, in fact, a girl is more likely to be sexually assaulted than she is to attend high school. She's more likely to be made a child bride than she is to attend high school. And those are things that fundamentally, as an organization, we don't accept. We have four girl-focused programs spanning everything from making sure that there's menstrual health and hygiene training in schools to giving girls small business training and entrepreneurship skills so that they're able to earn an income for themselves. And I'd love to walk you through some of those stories. Ah, yes, here we go. For example, Sarah, who's here, who did our business brains training, and as you can see here, has some little butterscotch candies in the bottom of the screen. She cooks those over an open flame in the street, sells them in her community and in her school, and is able to earn about three to four extra dollars a week which doesn't sound like a lot, but is the difference between two and three meals a day in Sierra Leone. So that's enormous for her to be able to stay in school and stay focused. But the reason that I'm here is to explain to you some of the things that we've done well as an organization or different as an organization and myself as a leader, because that's what you really want to learn about. And so I really want to emphasize this point. Because when I get up and I give these speeches about, hey, we want to educate a million girls across Africa, and then I start talking about biodegradable pads and butterscotch candies and toilet blocks, people are like, man, this chick's crazy. Like, she said she wanted to educate a million girls, and now she's jumping for joy over these things. But something that I'm really set on, and we're really set on as an organization, is yeah, we do jump for joy for those things. We have to explain that changing the world isn't easy. If it were easy, it would be done that we're celebrating every step along the way. The good, the bad, the ugly, we're going to talk about it, we're going to be transparent about it. And something that is quite different about us as an organization is that we do a lot of that. We do a lot of talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly. And a really good example of having this kind of unique voice happened to me in my first week at One Girl. I'd just come from being a lawyer, I wrote an email that was announcing, announcing myself to the whole One Girl crew, and I showed it to the comms director and said, oh, what do you think of the email? She's like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it's good. We're going to add about 10 exclamation marks and three awesomes. It's like, all right, you've got me in the right frame of mind. But you've just got to talk about it like it is, which is something that we do consistently as an organization. We like to tell it like it is. So there's three main points that I actually want to make, and it kind of explains why I've gone on this long roundabout tangent of how I ended up here. First and foremost, the thing that we do differently as an organization is we have that unique voice. At a time where development speak kind of drowns out a lot of those conversations, we're just kind of talking at pe to people at the level that they're at, and that's able to cut through a lot of the noise. The second thing is making it personal, and that's why I told you my story. Because everyone talks about poverty, everybody knows the statistics, but the thing that truly connects people to it at a time when there's so many of those dark conversations and there is so much cynicism is being able to say, hey, this is why I'm passionate about it. And consistently, particularly when talking to young people, I feel that that cuts through so much noise. And we're able to have really different conversations with people because we're talking about it on a personal level. All of my staff, none of them have gay parents like I do, but all of my staff have a reason for being in this position. In fact, our ambassadors around the country, of which there are over 400, could all tell you a story as eloquently as I have about what has brought them here 
to giving a speech, to being a representative of one girl, because that's something we embrace, is that personal connection and what has brought you to this moment. The third point, and this is something that I'm gonna kind of talk you through with an example of how we're a bit different, is that we've built ourselves a tribe. We've built ourselves a group of people who are so committed to us and have themselves represented as this kind of unique one girl voice that they will defend us through anything, and I love that. That by making people feel special and making people feel particularly connected to this organization, we're able to do things that we wouldn't be able to as a staff of eight people sitting here in Melbourne. So I want to give you an example of that happening just recently. Oh, it seems my clicker's gone out again. Oh, here we go. Through that, we've been able to raise over $5 million. We've been able to educate over 29,000 women and girls. And let me give you an example of our tribe playing out just recently. So we run a campaign called Do It In A Dress where people wear a school dress representing education, opportunity, empowerment. This is Greg modeling one of our school dresses. Doesn't matter if you're seven or 70, doesn't matter your gender, you chuck on a school dress and you pick a challenge, you raise $300, which is what it costs us to educate a girl for a year, do your challenge in a school dress, and as a result, a girl gets educated. We've been running this campaign for six years. Last year it raised $800,000. We were expecting a pretty good this year, this year. But all of a sudden, and we see people do all sorts of crazy things. This school called Craigburn Primary School said, hey, we want to raise $900. We want to educate three girls. They were going fine towards that goal. They were going to collect their gold coins. And then a certain sender had something to say. So Corey Bernardi tweeted, one school in South Australia now has wear a dress day. This gender morphing is really getting absurd. Hashtag Ozpol, which is an interesting tweet. But something that I really want to emphasize about this is this could have gone really wrong for us could have gone really, really wrong. But by the time I had seen this tweet, we were out at a staff meeting, this tweet went out, by the time I'd seen this tweet, already there had been $17,000 donated in response to this, and there had been hundreds of tweets from our ambassadors and people in the broader One Girl community. I hadn't even seen it, there had been no official response, there was nothing on the One Girl side but because we have people who are so aggressively involved with the organization who don't actually work for us, suddenly this was happening. We had people commenting who had never seen us before because the word got out so quickly because of our extended family. And a huge part of our growth that we've seen over the last few years, which has been astronomical, do it and address growing at over 40% a year, the organization growing at over 35% a year, has been because we've made ourselves seem bigger than we are with that extended family. And that means that I don't even have to say anything about Corey Bernardi because there are lots of other people who do it for me. So I love that example. I love what's happened in the last few weeks. This is actually an old screenshot. They've now raised over $300,000 compared to their $900 target. And we were in every major media outlet in the country. My life for the last two weeks has been press conferences, which has been interesting. Because of this, I, it really brought home to me the kind of importance of those three points that I want to make, about having a unique voice as an organization, which makes you stand out in any sort of crisis, about keeping it personal, being able to explain why you're part of this, why it's important, and thirdly, of building that network of people who talk for you, so you don't even have to do it yourself. So I want to leave you with a sentiment that I always kind of bring it back to, particularly when I'm giving speeches in schools, because I love, my favorite part of my job is when I get a teenage girl to say she's a feminist. That is my absolute favorite part of my job, is I come, I give these big speeches, these are the things I'm, I'm passionate about, and I make people share what they're passionate about. What's the thing they want to create change in? What doesn't sit right in their gut? And I remind people that change happens because we demand it, and consistently, I will always, always see young people be like, you know what, yeah, I'm going to confess. This is the thing that I feel passionately about. This is the thing that I want to change, which always brings a smile to my face. So I want to give you all a chance to ask some questions, but I do want to also thank you for your time. I uh, know I've gone on a, a crazy rant about Corey Venardi, but the thing I really want to emphasize here is just that my journey has not been linear, has not been clear. When I told my moms, oh, screw that law degree I did, I want to go work in charity, probably wasn't what they were expecting, but I have absolutely no regrets. Blood, sweat, and tears to get here, but I'm really, really happy to be here in the end. So bottom of my heart, good luck on your own journey. Thank you. Who's up first? Here we go. Sorry. Um, thank you. That was great. I've got a question. One Girl's an organisation where your founder, Chantel, 
was able to hand over the reins at a good, like, can you comment on the transition within the organisation? Because a lot of uh, younger organisations, you know, may really struggle with that. Yeah. Absolutely. So for everyone's benefit, One Girl was co-founded in 2009 by David Dixon and Chantelle Baxter. Chantelle then ran the organization as CEO until I took over, gosh, almost two years ago now. And, um, and then she was moving to the States and needed to do quite a rapid transition to me taking over from her. And that was something that the board was incredibly worried about. Chantelle is uh, quite recognizable as a personality. She was One Girl for a lot of people. Um, and was a huge part of that rapid growth and had had a lot of media exposure. And it was something that I think we honestly had more concern about than actually eventuated. And a huge part of that was because people had become so enmeshed in us as an organization, our repeat rates for peer-to-peer -peer campaigns are so much higher than industry standard of people coming back year on year on year so that we had enough people who were staying with the organization to kind of carry on that transition. Something that I would say on that, as this is my second time taking over as CEO from a founder, um, both times very challenging. And it always will be, because the founder is always a particular type of person, and then you need to find somebody who's really different to be that next person. And Chantelle and I would both say up front, the things she is the strongest at are my weak points and vice versa, that so much of the last 18 months has been consolidation. They had grown really rapidly, and it was me coming in and being like, OK, We've got to clean up shop. We've got to get these things working. We've got to make sure our CRM is in place. And to do that, you really do need to look at who's somebody who has those skills to still get the buy-in from the team after they've had this super inspirational, super like larger than life kind of founder running the team for years, as well as who's going to have the skills to actually get the organization on track for big growth. So huge lessons to be learned there. But yeah, never, I would say, just don't discount how hard that transition is going to be for everybody. <laughs> um, who, who are the partners you work with on the ground in Africa? Who gets to decide which parts of Africa you need, needs the most help? And um, yeah, just some of the due diligence and bona fides around that. Yeah, great question. So we have a combined partnership model as well as staff in country. So we have three staff in Sierra Leone and then we're completely partnership based in Uganda. Increasingly we are moving towards a partnership model. So we have a whole range of partners, everyone from Beloga Women's Group to we've worked with BRAX in the past on different menstrual health and hygiene studies to Restless Development in particular is a huge partner of ours in Sierra Leone. And I mean, a huge part of that is we have two program staff here in Australia who are currently over in Sierra Leone at the moment, actually, and go over on a yearly basis, work with the staff on the ground um, who run our scholarship program on their own. But in terms of the due diligence stuff, that's something that we're quite lucky that we've had a board that's incredibly experienced. That obviously, um, my experience isn't high as a 25-year-old, and we have these people that we can rely on to really get us on the right track. So we've always on the board had somebody who's been part of Oxfam, plan, care, who are able to advise us on the best way of doing that. My big learning over the last two years has been to do it through a partnership model wherever possible. So we always look for community-based women's organizations who have had one really big partner before us who have done a lot of due diligence that kind of gets it out of the way. Because as soon as we work out that there's a tiny organization that just happens to have done one project with UN Women, Fantastic. They already have all of the documents ready to go for us to do our due diligence with them. And that has made it a really smooth transition. I actually have a question from online that uh, follows up on what Ash just asked, which is that how do you work with those partners to help them grow? That's something that we've learned a lot about and, and kind of just talking with the partners about what are the realities for them. So one of the big things we found with BWG, for example, is that they told us their greatest problem was that they didn't have a website to communicate their impact with. And so we worked with them to develop their website so that they could find partners other than ourselves, which was a huge learning experience in terms of it's not just a, a matter of um, you know, money for individual projects that they want to fund, but on top of that, actually talking to the organization about what's going to make the difference if we have to leave or if you want to work with several other partners other than ourselves. Um, I'm, I'm wondering more of your personal journey coming in with being 25 years old and managing that feeling of 
like not having experience, for example, like you just mentioned, how do you manage that feeling and still be confident? Cry in the shower about your crippling self-doubt is the first tip now. Um, there's a few different points to this. So yeah, I am the youngest member of One Girl. My second in command is almost twice my age. And that was incredibly intimidating coming in. So previously, I'd been CEO of a youth organization where I was about the same age as everybody, um, which had its own challenges. Everybody was friends. Worst environment to work in is when you actually really, really like the people that you're working with, that it's hard to tell them no. Um, and then was lucky to kind of be in a prison environment where I was quite young and had to be larger than life, and that pushed me into this kind of mode of just coming in and being really confident and brash. I would say that uh, the big thing with one girl is that I came in with actually too much self-doubt about my age. I came in and I was like, oh man, like I don't have as much experience as these people and they're, they're gonna hate me instantly because I'm so young. And so I went into this full collaboration mode of like, let me get everybody's opinion and then we're gonna come to a democratic decision together. And, I um, forced two of my staff members after the first six months, like, give me a criticism, like, what's something I could have done better and everything. And they were, oh, oh I don't want to, you know, I was like, come on, tell me. And both of them ended up saying, independently of each other, oh, I actually think that you should make more decisions, that a lot of the time you have the right perspective, but you're asking everybody for opinions before you come to it. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's actually right, that's fair. And I became much more confident in, you know what, you are the CEO, sometimes you do have to make a unilateral decision, sometimes you have to make an unpopular decision. But it took me a little bit to realize that I was allowed to be in that position from such a young age. I've only ever had one conflict over my age. I, I just had a staff member who made a few comments about it, and eventually I pulled her aside and I said, you know what, if it's a comment on my maturity or my experience or my skill level, I'll take it, but I won't take it on my age. And she was like, oh, you're 100% right, and I never heard it again. So I think that it's just a matter of really assessing for yourself what, what might be the problem and what is the best way to approach it and not be too intimidated by it. Hmm. I can see the, the wheels moving, people are thinking. <laughs> I just want to say that I'm from Adelaide, and when the Corey Bernardi thing happened, it was the best thing on the whole world. But what was so lovely about it was I knew some kids who'd been, who'd been to Craigburn, but seriously, the community, it just, it was, it was exciting, and suddenly oh, yeah. you knew all these people were donating, and they knew about one girl that they didn't know about it before, mm. and we had friends of ours were busking in the mall after that amazing. for one girl in dresses. It was oh, great. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was oh, such no, a great... It's... Thank you, Corey Bernardi. Yes, thank you. I, I actually, I made such a point of doing all these media interviews and never saying his name. And now it's great to be able to like speak with like audience and be like, yeah, I owe Corey Bernardi my firstborn. Like he's been amazing for us. We have thousands of new donors who we had the unfortunate problem that they weren't really donating to us. They were like rage donating against Corey. But we came at that from a very specific angle of, okay, so what is our email to engage these people with a cause they wouldn't necessarily normally donate to? Like, as Corey has pointed out, these are people who would normally be donating to the Yes campaign or you know, other issues that are going on. How can we make them see girls not being in school as an injustice, and therefore they need to get involved with this particular cause? Mm -hmm. So it's been really great. And something I loved about it was uh, the big threat was the media is going to come in, the kids are going to be so intimidated, it could be this really big problem at the school. The entire school community, parents, teachers were like, let's put on school dresses because we're going to get way more media attention than young kids in yeah. school dresses. And they did. Yeah. Every dad was coming in doing drop off in a school dress, yeah. which was amazing to see. <laughs> you mentioned briefly there, uh, just on the email after, you know, to re-engage people. What are some of the, if you can share them, some of the other strategies you're putting in place to uh, really sort of capture those people so that it isn't just a flash in the pan and then you're going back to where the organization, not that it wasn't doing well, but you know yeah. what I mean. I think that the really big problem that we had to kind of counter is the media not knowing about us and being a little bit confused about the whole thing, wanted to do a story of like, tiny charity gets their big break. And we had to go and reassert ourselves and be like, no, we made 1.2 million last year. Because we kept getting asked, what are you gonna do with all this extra money? We're like, it's not extra money, it's, it's the money we wanted, it's the money we expected, you know, it's just stuff that would normally come in. And that was a huge risk, is that we would come off as small, on the other hand, that we would come off as vindictive or, um, you know, kind of capitalizing on this outrage. And so for us, that was about very, very clever media management, that I had like a set list of things I was willing to comment on and nothing else. 
I was actually terrified of media from the get-go because obviously Do It and Address has nothing to do with the fact that I have gay parents. But if anyone Googled me, I've been very vocal about the fact that I have gay parents. And that could have gotten picked up and blown out in the media. And so uh, we tackled that head on. And I said, any media interview we're doing, we're saying up front, yep, our CEO happens to be the child of uh, two, uh, two women. But that is not a question that gets to be asked on air. So there was like that kind of media management side of things and being incredibly prescriptive about what we would speak to. And on the other hand, it was with all the new donors, all the new participants that we um, had as part of the campaign. Firstly, we engaged them from how they came in, but then straight away, we started trying to change the conversation. So we did a couple days of like, Craig Byrne, Craig Byrne. And then we put more money into our Facebook advertising, into all the sort of things that we were doing to our community about other things that people were doing in address because we can't have do it in a dress becomes Craig Byrne does it in a dress. We needed to show, look at this woman who's celebrating her 70th birthday in a dress. Look at this person throwing themselves out of an airplane in a school dress. And start to change that conversation so that it actually converted into long-term recognition for the brand rather than, as you say, kind of flash in the pan problems. Mm. I do steal the mic. Um, just a logistical thing with the do it in a dress. How do people get the school dresses to the point that it, you know you wear them once and then put them away until next year or yeah so there's a from yeah it's a whole big thing and it's a constant question for us it's really challenging so we both tell people wear your old school dress or get one from your local op shop but we obviously have dresses available which we get manufactured here in Australia which have all the branding on them of I'm doing it in a school dress to educate girls in Africa um, and we sell those for the cost that it costs us to manufacture them, as well as having a dress borrowing library. But at the end of the campaign, we say, hey, send it back our way. And for any large events, when people do a yoga day, when people do the marathon, they tend to borrow from our big dress library, and we have it going out. We're not at the stage yet where we're so big that's a problem. You know, we're talking 2,000, 3,000 dresses a year. I can imagine that becoming a problem in the future, depending on how peer-to-peers continue to track. But for now, it's working. <laughs> uh, another quick one from me. Sorry, I don't want to steal the mic if there are other questions out there. But um, as someone who's come in uh, and replaced founders in multiple instances, uh, what would you say to other founders who that will eventually happen to? What should they be putting in place? How should they be thinking about it in the terms of that transition? That's a really great question. Um, this has been different the two times that I've taken over. One was in a period, the first one was in a period of total chaos. The second was a lot better that Chantel and I actually had a handover for me to be in this position now. The thing I would say in general to founders other than like the super obvious of like have good knowledge accumulation is to I think think really carefully about the relationship that's built with the board and with the team. So what are the dynamics because often the founder has seen it grow from like them sitting alone in a room to where it is now. And they have a board and they have a team around them. And that board and team have only ever known one culture, one person in charge. And that can fix for a really long time. So for a new person coming in, it can be incredibly hard to create those changes and, and different um, kind of expectations. So a really good example of that that I've seen, less so here, but more so in my first gig, was the board were so operational. They were, had their noses in every little bib and bob because there had been that culture created that the founder was a little bit all over the place, was great creatively, but didn't have um, kind of that, that operational focus. And so when I came on and I was trying to make decisions and get things done, I just felt like there was someone breathing down my neck the whole time at, at board level because that culture had become so ingrained. And I would have loved if I was able to come in. And this was part advice for myself as someone coming in, but for the founder as well, of being able to come in fresh start and just be like, OK, I'm in charge. What's a normal board CEO relationship? And also, what are the expectations of the team? And that was something that I knew coming in this time. I was much more clear with the team of, hey, I watched you work with Chantel for a week. These are the things I saw. These are the things that are going to keep going. And you can feel confident they're going to keep going. These are the things that are going to change and where I'm a little bit different. And that's something that I think um, founders in general could be more attentive to is, okay, what is the organizational culture I've created? Is there anything that I need to, to look at a little bit before handing over the reins? We've got a good company, a challenge that we're looking at doing around Christmas time, which is also a dress up thing. Yeah. 
and it's called the Grandfather Christmas Challenge. So raise a grand for charity, and Love if it. your supporters raise a grand, you, you've got to dress up as Amazing. Santa for a day. If it's matched funding, two days, and they might spend all December dressed up. Uh, so on paper sounds like a good idea, and then I've kind of pitched it to a few of our corporate partners, um, IAG and Optus and Flight Centre, and they've kind of got already a few campaigns going on. Yep. So I guess the other way to do it is to pitch it to our 1,500 charities and say, get your donors to do the Grandfather Christmas Challenge. Yeah. Or find some people and then get the media. Like, what advice would you have to mm. make that go Jeez. viral? Okay, make it go viral. The biggest thing that made Do It and Address be successful was our ambassador program, that we recruited people around Australia, made them responsible for the success of the campaign, did a day of training with them about what it meant, gave them this special status, people have to apply to be ambassadors, and it's, it is truly our secret sauce. Many years on, ambassadors are still responsible for raising almost half of the total with Do It and Address each year. It is a completely different kettle of fish because you get one person from an office who is the ambassador, they go back to their office, they recruit 10 people to be in their team, fundraising efforts are just through the roof. We have really high expectations of them and they, they meet it every time. So that was some advice we were given about the virality that has stayed true. We've tried different things with media. A chair of our board is head of a PR agency. We still struggle with media outside of Corey Bernardi. And so relying on that and relying on being different as a peer-to-peer -peer is really challenging, particularly around Christmas time. And so I think that you are better off kind of coming from this core position of, all right, how can we rally the troops um, in a particular way? Something that you have going for you there, which I am reflecting on more generally about peer-to-peers and finding this really interesting looking at the future, is that there are increasingly peer-to-peers coming into the market that are low commitment, Dressing up like Santa or dressing up in a school dress and doing a challenge, big commitment. So people do fundraise when they commit to do that. Campaigns like Polished Man, great. Great for virality. So many people participating. Polished Man raises slightly more than we do every year. They have like 60, 70,000 people participate. We raise almost that much with 3,000 people participating. Because when people get involved, it's not just like I'm going to paint a nail and get a free burger. It's like a higher level of commitment. And so it's something to assess with your peer-to-peer -peer really early on is, OK, are we OK with a smaller number of people, less virality, but being able to raise a large amount from that small group? Or are we truly looking for our like, ice bucket challenge campaign, where it's going to go super viral, we'll have all of these people having like a light level or a, t a light touch point with our campaign? So I think knowing that about your campaign early on really helps you assess whether or not you're going to get that virality or you come at it from like a groundswell. So, two things, the funds aren't for us, we're the intermediary, yeah. so we're the platform, so we have to, do we have to give charities the tools that then they create that with their ambassadors? And then the other question like mm. we'll find out is whether charities need to own their own thing or whether they're happy to piggyback on an idea. That's true, and charities it's, usually have a very clear idea of like this is what we're doing for Christmas. Like, not always, you know, sometimes we're just like, oh man, like what are we going to do for Christmas? Because we get to the end of October and do it and dress is done and everyone's just burned out. We're done. We have nothing else to do. But um, I think that that would be a really interesting conversation to have with a few charities. <laughs> yeah. <That's all>. <laughs> a good conversation. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Morgan, for all those wonderful pieces of uh, information, insight, and sharing your story. A small gift from oh, us uh, for saying to say thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.